The question is, what is my definition of sustainability? And, the, and that's an excellent question because I don't use the conventional definitions. I found them very frustrating. I, I found them to be fuzzy. So I had a brilliant idea one day. I went to the Oxford English Dictionary, <laughs> which lists, I think, about 12 definitions of the word sustain. And, and I use a couple of those. Um, one is to maintain in a desired state or condition. That is what sustain means, that you maintain something in a desired state or condition. And this meshes with my conception of what sustainability is. Sustainability emerges from people's values. Sustainability emerges from what people value. People will work to sustain what they value, which is usually some aspect of their current way of life. So sustainability to me is the science of continuity. It's the science of sustaining, maintaining what people value. Uh, as I said, uh, I think I might have misunderstood what you said up there, but if you could clarify it, I, I caught... Um, uh, I think I caught um, your statement there as you were indicating steady state would necessarily lead to low employment, and I'm not sure how I understand that because everything I've read in the last year, you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. That's oh, I agree. I, so I agree. at some point, the planet will shift to a steady state. It has to. Oh, I, 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 I think you're probably correct. I'm just not advocating it. Uh, some, people, <laughs> some, some people advocate a steady state. Um, no, I, I am very careful because advocating a steady state is in a sense making a political statement and, and you turn off a lot of the audience, the audience that I'd like to reach by doing that. Uh, there are severe consequences to a steady state economy uh, given that employment depends on economic growth. I just would counter that a little bit by saying that um, a lot of the externalities currently in our economic models aren't borne by the people that cause them. If you had to um, actually account for those externalities, that would create the jobs that you're saying wouldn't exist because if a company made something and was responsible for undoing its mess at the end, mm -hmm. it would have to hire people to do it. Hence, it would become somewhat um, self-sustaining or sustainable, much like the permaculture example where the waste of one becomes the input mm -hmm. to another. Yeah. Well, you may anyway, be right. I, I just wasn't sure if I caught that right, what you were suggesting there. As I understand, the Netherlands has a policy that if you buy a new car, you, you pay upfront for the ultimate cost of tearing it apart and disposing of the parts or recycling the parts. Um, and, and I think that's what you're talking about. Um, I don't know how that experiment is going in the Netherlands, whether the Dutch all simply drive to Germany to buy their cars. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how the experiment is going, um, but I hear what you're saying and, and I hope you're right. As we're recording this, let's think about um, the people that might be listening to the podcast, the audio recording. Um, we have Dr. Joseph Tainter here. We've just heard a talk on collapse of societies and um, complexity and how complexity could lead to collapse. And now we are taking questions. Um, looks like Mr. Chris Bedford has the next question. Yes. Um, so thank you, by the way. I think it was an extraordinary presentation, very useful. Um, I think what, your avoidance of the steady state political cost question, I think is, is sort of indicative of the real reality that I think the implication of your presentation is that we are gonna end up in, uh, with a, a different kind of lifestyle and different kind of economy and a less complex economy. And so my question is, are there any examples of uh, societies or communities intentionally simplifying their systems in order to survive as opposed to increasing complexity? Yes, that, that's, that's a topic in, in other talks that I give. Uh, in, in brief, the best example that I know of of a large-scale society systematically simplifying and surviving um, is the Byzantine Empire, which was the eastern half of the Roman Empire that survived the collapse. They lost half their land to the Arabs um, during the course of the seventh century AD, and it looked like they were about to go under. Uh, they also lost half their revenue and could, could no longer maintain their professional army. So what they did was they systematically simplified. Um, they switched to a peasant militia with peasants based in the landscape fighting for their own land. 
uh, what you find is that the monetary economy goes away, the period sometimes known as the, as the Byzantine Dark Ages. They overall simplified the government, uh, they simplified administration, they simplified the army, and it worked. They were able to recover, and in a, and in a couple of centuries, they were back on the offensive again. Uh, it, but So the good news is, yes, there is a, an example of a large, very large, <coughs> complex society systematically simplifying. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The bad news is they didn't do it voluntarily. They did it because their backs were to the wall. We're going to have about 20 minutes of questions, and then we'll move to lunch at about 25 Could after. Could someone get me a little more water? Would someone <laughs> mind doing that? Looks like Hans has the next question. Uh, it strikes me that it's possible problems become intractable. We can find problems to be intractable because of what we say is true. For example, it is a commonplace for us to say growth creates jobs, technology creates jobs, productivity creates jobs, innovation creates jobs. Um, I just want to throw out a really wild-ass theory, and that's this. Uh, jobs are created by human beings who choose to support human beings who employ human beings. They're not caused by productivity. They're not caused by uh, cons rising consumption. They're actually caused by people choosing to employ people. So w if we looked at that, would we have all these problems with productivity? For example, we could look at the research and development people. We have this wonderful uh, full employment policy coming up for them because their, product, you know, their output is getting level. So we're going to need more and more R&D people we're going to have to employ more and more just to keep at a state level, which is good for employment. It solves that problem. Um, yeah, yes, but, but I'm sorry, was there a question? Well, what would happen if we looked at, what if, would, can you see us entertaining the possibility that all these things that we say cause employment aren't the things that cause employment? It actually involves people making choices. Yes, but people make choices in response to incentives. And so what are the incentives to create, to, uh, to create jobs and hire people? I don't know. I didn't need any mindset to come here to involve me give, anyone giving me money. Mm -hmm. It's because I think it's important. Yeah, but you didn't, yeah. Yes, but we were talking about creating jobs. Um, yeah. you, you didn't create a job by coming here. Um, yeah, yes, wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful if we, if we all um, altruistically employed someone else? Wouldn't it be wonderful? But most people won't do that. Uh, businesses are in business to make money. Uh, and, and I don't see that ending anytime soon. I, I, don't, I don't see altruism ruling the business world anytime soon. I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, it, it strikes me as idealistic, and, and I, I tend to be more realistic, I'm afraid. But thank you. Our next question goes to Ms. Nicole Foss. When you wrote your book, the, your last chapter was looking at the issue of competitive peer polities and how that could extend the expansion phase mm -hmm. further into the realm of declining marginal returns to complexity. Yeah. When you wrote that, we were at the very beginning of the era of globalization, which has, I would argue, driven us drastically further down that path that you were anticipating than you might have anticipated at that time. And I was wondering if you'd like to comment on what you see as that dynamic, the, the creation of a global network of competitive peer polities and the implications of that for collapse scenarios? Well, c competition, whether it's in military competition as in the Cold War or in commercial competition, drives increasing complexity. Competition undermines sustainability in the long term. It, it may enhance it in the short term by producing innovation, but in the long term, competition produces diminishing returns, high costs and diminishing returns, and ultimately undermines sustainability. <coughs> who, has, who would like to ask a question? Killian? It's right here. <laughs> oh, Stephanie. Oh, yes. Um, were there philosophical or religious uh, justifications tendered up for the simplification of the Byzantine society? Oh no, it was, their backs were to the wall. No, no, no the, the justification is we, we do this or the Arabs are gonna conquer everything, which they did try to do. Um, as I observe the various things that people discuss about complexity and collapse and peak oil and all this, um, it occurs to me, 
Um, for example, going back to your definition of sustainability, to me, it's a constant. Sustainability is a state where you can continue doing whatever you're doing or some variation on it for into, you know, infinity, you know, as long as you care to keep doing it. Um, that, that, that's actually possible, you know, such as uh, societies that have existed for thousands of years in the same land space because of how they manage themselves. And so I think there is an actual uh, definition of sustainability that is relatively absolute. And it occurs to me also that for the first time in history, we actually know where the temporal limits are. We know where the limits in the future really are. Mm -hmm. We have limits to fuels. We have limits to space. We have limits to water. We have limits to climate. Climate is driving towards the limits that we can't survive if they go far enough. So it seems to me that at this point, we actually have an opportunity to look ahead, know what is very likely to happen given certain scenarios, and then instead of forecasting, do some backcasting. And when we do that backcasting, then I think we end up at the conclusion of something approaching a steady state or some variant thereof. Um, I was wondering if you have any. I, I think one problem, you're a wonderful audience, but one problem with this audience is that you're self-selected. Um, you're all aware of, of these issues. I can, I can assure you the population at large is not aware of the things that we're talking about. Uh, I teach a sustainability seminar in spring semester and I tell my students, go into the local Walmart and look at the people shopping there. No, no criticism of people who shop in Walmart. I shop there myself. Um, but I tell them, go into the local Walmart and ask yourselves, how many of the people in that store are aware of the things that we're talking about? Uh, and, and the answer is darn few of them. Uh, one of the major issues in sustainability is that humans did not evolve to be broad-scale thinkers. We did not evolve to think broadly in terms of either time or space, and so most of us don't. Right, but I guess my point really is that we are a self-selected audience, and we're here to actually have that discussion. Mm -hmm. So I think if, I'm wondering if you think that's an, uh, an appropriate way to have the discussion, at least among us. Oh, certainly. Yes, yes. I mean, what one hopes that, that the discussions here get extended to friends and neighbors and co-workers and, and ultimately have some influence. Mary's next. Um, have you found in looking at various societies that have been through a collapse that certain either larger social structures or institutions within a given society are better at maintaining mass well-being through the process um, or not? Essentially, it doesn't matter how, how society is structured or whether there's specific institutions within a society that can help essentially peasants and other sort of masses to survive it well. Um, very few governments have, have conceived of themselves as having the purpose of, of providing for the general welfare. That's, I mean, that, that's a fairly recent phenomenon, and even in the world today, it's pretty rare. Um, Local well-being is best assured, I think, through local institutions, through local organizations, if, if that's what you're asking me. Yeah. 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 So what about religion and the role of religion in the collapse? Has it always been positive, negative? Religion has, has a function, and this is one of the interesting things, because when the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, it, I mean, Constantine apparently was adopting it explicitly as a unifying factor. Um, you know, with himself being the representative of God on earth. Uh, and, and that's, of course, how European monarchs ruled through the Middle Ages as the representative of God on earth. Um, religion is a unifying factor, but, but the problem that they had with Christianity in the Roman Empire was that it was fairly new and it was highly diversified. There were all of these schisms and sects and, and so forth and so on. That's why they had to keep having councils to denounce uh, Arianism and all these other things. Um, it, 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 I, I, I wouldn't say that religion really played a role. I think the collapse would have happened with or without the shift to Christianity. 